Welcome to the Henry George Daily Devotional, episode 48. We start chapter 7, the correlation and coordination of these laws in book 3, the laws of distribution. Cool. George writes, the conclusions we have reached, well, you know, how big is this chapter? Not big. We're going to do two chapters in one video. The conclusions we have reached as to the laws which govern the distribution of wealth recast a large and most important part of the science of political economy, as at present taught, overthrowing some of its most highly elaborated theories and shedding a new light on some of its most important problems. Yet in doing so, no disputable ground has been occupied. Not a single fundamental principle advanced that is not already recognized. The law of interest and the law of wages which we have substituted for those now taught are necessary deductions from the great law which alone makes any science of political economy possible. The all-compelling law that is as separable from the human mind as attraction is inseparable from matter, and that's the gravity. That's gravity, and without which it would be impossible to provide. It's a cool word. Or calculate any human action, the most trivial or the most important. This fundamental law that men seek to gratify their desires with the least exertion. You know, you could also call this the law of incentives I guess as I'm terming it in our modern era we talk a lot about incentives and this uh, and aligning someone's incentive so somebody has the we, we assume you know people have desires and they want to gratify them and then they do so with the least exertion so they are incentivized to do th to follow this path to gratify their desires that's how I would describe it in the, an incentivization paradigm this fundamental law that men seek to gratify their desires with the least exertion becomes, when viewed in its relation to one of the factors of production, the law of rent, in relation to another, the law of interest, in relation to a third, the law of wages. And in accepting the law of rent, and I'll, you know, as George mentioned, interest is the return to capital. And capital is just stored up labor, and wages is the return to labor. So, in some sense, interest should be. It's funny, right? Because there's the capitalists and uh, the socialists, and they all consider the battles between capital and labor, and then they think land should be thought of as capital. And the capital, and they're like, but the socialists think that the labor should be in control. I mean, this is broad stroke stuff. And then the capitalists think again, they, they kind of agree. It's all about it's all about labor and capital. And they think of land as capital. But they think that, uh, you know, the capital should run things. I guess that's how some people characterize it. And then George comes along and says, y'all are dumbos. Capital is just stored up labor. And land is none of those. Land is its own thing. And, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm being a little unfair. I mean, capitalists and socialists do say there are three factors of production, often land, labor, and uh, uh, capital. But they, they, at least in the modern era, they really minimize the land question. All right. George says... Um, and in accepting the law of rent, which since the time of Ricardo has been accepted by every economist of standing. When did, um, is it Henry Ricardo? Ricardo's law of rent. David Ricardo. David Ricardo. He was born in 72. I know that Wealth of Nations was published in 76. That's funny. He was influenced. Oh, he influenced Malthus, Keynes, Moore, whoever Moore is. <laughs> he was influenced by Smith. Oh, he's saying Malthus and Ricardo 
influence one another. Bentham Mill, Rahman Ibn Khaldun, I don't know. He's a Whig, member of parliament from the UK. Ricardo. Richie Ricardo. Ricky Davy Ricardo. Just make sure you don't search for just Ricardo. Mm, word to the wise from Twitch chat. And in accepting the law of rent, which since the time of Ricardo has been accepted by every economist of standing, and which, like a geometrical axiom, has but to be understood to compel assent, the law of wages and law of sorry, law of interest and law of wages, as I have stated them, are inferentially accepted as its necessary sequences. In fact, it is only relatively that they can be called sequences, as in the recognition of the law of rent, they too must be recognized. For on what depends the recognition of the law of rent? Evidently upon the recognition of the fact that the effect of competition is to prevent the return to labor and capital being anywhere greater than upon the poorest land in use. It is... No one thought that this poor land was going to be such a big deal. Everyone thinks it's crappy land and doesn't care about it. But actually, <laughs> uh, it isn't seeing this that we see that the owner of land will be able to claim as rent all of its produce, which exceeds what would be yielded Excuse me, to an equal application of labor and capital on the poorest land in use. The harmony and correlation of the laws of distribution as we have now apprehended them are in striking contrast with the want of harmony which characterizes these laws as presented by the current political economy. Let us state them, state them side by side. Uh, if, you're only, if you're not watching, you're missing out on a nice little table that George makes for us. All right, on the left column, the heading is the current statement, and the right heading is the true statement. We will start with the current statement for rent. The current statement is rent depends on the margin of cultivation rising as it falls and rising and falling as it rises. The true statement is the same. Rent depends on the margin of cultivation rising as it falls and falling as it rises. All right, we're so far so good. Uh, the current statement for wages. Wages depend upon the ratio between the number of laborers and the amount of capital devoted to their employment. Womp womp. The true statement is wages depend upon the margin of cultivation, falling as it falls and rising as it rises. Yay! Uh, interest, the current statement is interest depends upon the equation between the supply of and demand for capital, or as is stated of profits, upon wages or the cost of labor rising as wages fall and falling as wages rise wah, wah. the true law of interest is that the interest its ratio with wages being fixed by the net power of increase which attaches to capital that's the reproductive forces of nature basically uh, on net averaged out because some forms of capital do not have uh, do not benefit from the reproductive force of nature. So interest depends on the margin of cultivation, falling as it falls and rising as it rises. Uh, and so since labor rises uh, as it falls and falls as it rises on the margin of cultivation. Um, oh, that's rent, sorry. Wages are falling as it falls and rising as it rises, interest falling as it falls and rising as it rises. Uh, that is a positive proportionality. So then George concludes, in the current statement of the laws of distribution, have no common center, no mutual relation. Ah, yes, in the current statement of the laws of distribution, yeah, there's no common center or relation betwixt them, yes. They are not co the correlating divisions of a whole, but measures of different qualities. In the statement we have given, the true statement, they spring from one point, support and supplement each other, and form the correlating divisions of a complete whole. 
That's why he chose to write a book about him. And so we finish chapter 7, uh, the correlation or something he called it, or the correlation coordination of these laws. Now, chapter 8, the statics of the problem thus explained. We have now obtained a clear, simple, and consistent theory of the distribution of wealth, which accords with first principles and existing facts, and which, when understood, will commend itself as self-evident. Before working out this theory, I have deemed it necessary to show conclusively the insufficiency of current theories. For in thought as in action, the majority of men do but follow their leaders, and a theory of wages which has not merely the support of the highest names, but is firmly rooted in common opinions and prejudices, will, until it has been proved untenable, prevent any other theory from being even considered. Just as the theory that the earth was the center of the universe prevented any consideration of the theory that it revolves on its own axis and circles round the sun, until it was clearly shown that the apparent movements of the heavenly bodies could not be explained in accordance with the theory of the fixity of the earth. There is, in truth, a marked resemblance between the science of political economy, as at present taught, and the science of astronomy, as taught previous to the recognition of the Copernican theory. Yes, both sciences were off-kilter. The devices by which the current political economy endeavors to explain the social phenomena that are now forcing themselves upon the attention of the world may well be compared to the elaborate system of circles and epicycles constructed by the learned to explain the celestial phenomena in a manner according with the dogmas of authority and the rude impressions and prejudice of the unlearned. And just as the observations which showed that this theory of cycles and epicycles could not explain all the phenomena of the heavens cleared the way for the consideration of the simpler theory that supplanted it, so will a recognition of the inadequacy of the current theories to account for social phenomena clear the way for the consideration of a theory that will give to political economy all the simplicity and harmony which the Copernican theory gave to the science of astronomy. Oh, if only it were so. I, we still have all of our uh, economics uh, economists that are the analog of these learned men with their theories of cycles and epicycles literally talking about you know the boom and bust cycles and uh, I don't know about the epicycles comparison but um ah uh, it all I mean the Georgian view on the boom and bust cycles is just that people will uh, realize that they can just speculate on land instead of actually being productive and more and more people do this until the you know straw bre straw breaks the camel's back so to speak and then you have a giant recession and then people start doing the actual productive work again and then people start realizing oh I don't need to do productive work I can speculate off of their productive work and you know um anyway Lots of complicated economic theory has been written in the 150 years since George wrote. And it's all a, a bunch of crock. I mean, thing is, they just work, a lot of them just work with flawed premises. And then they uh, apply really good, you know, they may or may not apply better or worse reasoning from that point, but, you know. If it starts off bad and you build off it, it's going to be skewed. Anyway, George continues. But at this point, the parallel ceases that the fixed and steadfast earth should be really whirling through space with inconceivable velocity is repugnant to the first apprehensions of men in every state and situation. But the truth I wish to make clear is naturally perceived and has been recognized in the infancy of every people, being obscured only by the complexities of the civilized state. This again is um, kind of wish... 
I mean, he gives examples of how even in a s complex state, these things hold. But uh, if he had, if only we had him with us now, and he could explain to us why this still applies to our big tech industry and our airplane industry, <sighs> these and our medical industry that's just so complex that these things people don't think they can be thought of th simply. Um, obscured only by the complexities. The warpings of selfish interest and the false direction which the speculations of the learned have taken. To recognize it, we have but to come back to first principles and heed simple perceptions. Nothing can be clearer than the pros than the proposition that the failure of wages to increase with increasing productive power is due to the increase of rent. Nothing can be clearer than the proposition that the failure of wages to increase with increasing productive power is due to the increase of rent. All the socialists want to say it's capital. Three things unite to production, labor, capital, and land, or just labor and land. Three parties divide the produce, the laborer, the capitalist, and the landowner. The laborer, the person who saved up labor, or the landowner. If, with an increase of production, the laborer gets no more and the capitalist no more, it is a necessary inference that the landowner reaps the whole gain. A bunch of these people that we call these like robber, baron, capitalist, pigs, or whatever, they had capital, yes, but they had land or they had artificial monot like they had the railroads right um they had artificial monopolies or um land monopoly oil oil barons we think of them as uh capitalists but they are landowners and the facts agree with the inference, though neither wages nor interests anywhere increase as material progress goes on. Yet the invariable accompaniment and mark of material progress is the increase of rent, the rise of land values. And it's like a little conflicting, right? Because building the railroads was good. Uh, mining oil is, is good. You know, creating wealth is good. This is this is that the paradox of progress and poverty, like you know the poverty arises with the progress, and then it also makes it sometimes hard to persuade people that the progress that the poverty um, can be got rid of because everyone's just like look at all of our progress uh, anyway. The increase of rent explains why wages and interest do not increase. The cause which gives to the landholder is the cause which denies to the laborer and capitalist. Uh, that wages, yeah, everyone talks about moving the cost of living when you move to uh, San Francisco offsets how much more you get paid as a employee at, you know, Meta or whatever. Um, the cost of living in it, that they're referring to is largely, and I would say fundamentally, all in the rent. Um, and if you ask that person, well, what are these costs of living? They would first of all say housing would be the number one thing. And just, yeah, there's, there's, we also tend to think of rent as being, um, you know, we use the term rent a bunch, rent, rent, rent. Uh, but a bunch of people are effectively paying a kind of rent even, they, even though they are homeowners. They have mortgages, and they are paying that to the banks and having to pay the interest on those loans. And then, of course, the banks are just getting a bunch of money printed by the government. Like The, gov the Fed loans all these banks money and then prints a bunch of money, and so those loans to those banks... Uh, become way cheaper to pay back because the Fed just printed a bunch of money. But that's getting into all these fancy manipulations of the modern economists and people will argue with me and I, yeah, that's harder to persuade you of. But anyway, back to Georgie boy. The increase of rent explains our wages and interest do not increase. The cause which gives to the landholder 
is the cause which denies to the laborer and capitalist. The wages and interest are higher in new than in old countries. It is not, as the standard economists say, because nature makes a greater return to the application of labor and capital, but because land is cheaper, and therefore, as a smaller proportion of the return is taken by rent, labor and capital can keep for their share a larger proportion of what nature does return. It is not the total produce, but the net produce, after rent has been taken from it, that determines what can be divided as wages and interest. Hence, the rate of wages and interest is everywhere fixed, not so much by the productiveness of labor as by the value of land. What, wherever the value of land is relatively low, wages and interest are relatively high. Wherever land is relatively high, wages and interest are relatively low. We need to make a shirt here that shows the, the algebraic formulation of this and then it shows should have like a, the three proportionalities. One is inverse and one is positive uh, or two, two are you know positive uh, proportionalities as in like wages and interest rise together and land um, are rent inversely. Um, right like back at our table here rent rises as the margin of cultivation falls and falls as it rises yep if I could go work on some land over there for free and make a hundred thousand dollars a year then this land right here it's not going to be so valuable because if I have to work on this land right here and I can only make $110,000, but I can go down the street and make 100000 why would I pay a lot of rent to live here? But, if the, but as things currently are, if I had to go find free land, I'd have to go way outside of society and try to work that land. And honestly, I probably wouldn't survive. So I probably would be making close to $0 as as a worker on the um, marginal land so I'm willing to pay a ton most of what I am able to earn when I work somewhere here that is owned of course um, I am above my family is above George's wedge we have we own land and um, yeah. Okay, where were we? Hence, the rate of wages and interest everywhere now is known by the value of land. Wherever the value of land is relatively low, wages and interest are relatively high. Wherever land is relatively high, wages and interest are relatively low. If production had not passed the simple stage in which all labor is directly applied to the land and all wages are paid in its produce, the fact that when the land owner takes a larger portion, the laborer must put up with a smaller portion could not be lost sight of. But the complexities of production in the civilized state in which so great a part is borne by exchange and so much labor is bestowed upon materials after they have been separated from the land, though they may to the unthinking disguise do not alter the fact that all production is still the union of the two factors land and labor and that rent the share of the landholder cannot be increased except at the expense of wages the share of the laborer and interest the share of the capital just as the portion of the crop which in the simpler forms of industrial organization the owner of agricultural land receives at the end of the harvest as his rent lessens the amount left to the cultivator as wages and interest so does the rental of land on which a manufacturing or commercial city is built lessen the amount which can be divided as wages and interest 
between the laborer and the capital. They're engaged in the production and exchange of wealth. In short, the value of land, depending wholly upon the power which its ownership gives of appropriating wealth created by labor, the increase of land values is always at the expense of the value of labor, and hence that the increase of productive power does not increase wages is because it does increase the value of land. Rent swallows up the whole gain, and pauperism accompanies progress. He solved it. It is unnecessary to refer to facts. They will suggest themselves to the reader. It is the general fact um, observable everywhere that as the value of land increases, so does the contrast between wealth and want appear. Uh, I went to Culver City, this gentrified, fancy part of L.A. It's gotten fancy at least in the past 10 years. And... Uh, yeah, there's all these nice little restaurants, you know, dotted along its main strip, and people having nice dinners, sitting next to these like little, they each get their own little fireplace kind of thing, and then, uh, and then, then you walk past a homeless bum sleeping uh, on the sidewalk. It is the universal fact that where the value of land is highest. Civilization exhibits the greatest luxury side by side with the most piteous destitution. To see human beings in the most abject, the most helpless and hopeless condition, you must go not to the unfenced prairies and the log cabins of new clearings in the backwoods, where man is single-handed in where man single-handed is commencing with the struggle with nature, the land is yet worth nothing, but to the great cities where the ownership of a little patch of ground is a fortune. Yeah. And we, it's kind of, you know, in, in George's age, the paupers weren't all on drugs. Um... And I guess it's sort of a separate question, like, I don't know, the, like, why is it that all of our, that so many of our poor people uh, get screwed up on drugs? It's not even clear exactly to me how, uh, you know, when I see sort of a crazy homeless person, how much that's drugs, or maybe that's just what mentally sort of happens to a person when they're isolated and desperate for 10 years. I don't know, like, uh, isolation in jail terms is a kind of cruel punishment, right? And I know that when I, like, I'm going on the internet and seeing friends is sort of helpful, uh, but if you couldn't interact, if I couldn't interact with anybody on the internet at all, and I just sat at home for, like, a, a day or two straight, it, you start going a little crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, that concludes today's episode of the Henry George Daily Devotional. George has figured it all out. What more do you want? Book 4, Effective Material Progress on the Issues the Dynamics of the Problem Yet to Seek. The Effect of Increase of Population upon the Issues the Effect of Improvements in the Arts. Uh, this will. Some people have been asking me about this. So we talked about it yesterday. Um, like, what the, what about when there are innovations um, and the expectations raised by material products? Interesting, interesting, interesting. See you later.